Most every mobile device and almost every major website makes extensive use of some form of cloud computing. However, even the most major services I'm mentioning, and, and one, one in particular, this week actually, can fail, leaving millions of users in the dark. Today we have Suresh Kara from Infosys to walk us through the clouds. Are we really one step closer to heaven? I hope you guys are able to hear me, right? OK. Uh, so what I wanted to focus on in this one hour was, are we one step closer to heaven? Uh, and that's a very, uh, very uh, you know, existential question for us, because if we are not, and if you're going to fall from wherever you are, it's going to be a very big fall. So, so when you look at this whole cloud computing thing, I think there are a couple of things that we need to be aware of. Firstly, what is it? I mean, it's, it's cloudy. It's, it's, it's not very clear. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, acronyms, and there are a bunch of names which are floating around. And do they make sense? Uh, has this been there before? Is it something new that has come up? And if it's new that has come up, what's the potential? What can we leverage out of it? Uh, and most importantly, uh, is the industry buying into this whole thing? It's important for the industry to buy into it because that fosters innovation in a way. So, so these are the aspects that we would probably explore and, and, and kind of see in detail, is it really making, uh, making any sense? So, so, and, and that's the reason why I themed the topic, a walk in the clouds. Uh, walk in the clouds, are we closer to heaven? Are we really closer to heaven? Or, or is, it, is it something that, uh, that, uh, that we hope to achieve, but we are far away from that? So, so that's roughly the gist of what I'll be talking about uh, today. And when we talk of clouds, obviously, there is a lot of thunder and lightning, a lot of noise, a lot of flashes. But the question is, are these relevant flashes? There is a lot of positive press. Uh, there is a lot of press about the cloud. Uh, the, just the phrase cloud computing probably uh, returns 30 to 40 million uh, hits on Google. Uh, if you look at the trend from Google, uh, you will observe that in the last few years, the number of articles being published, the number of, uh, number of people wanting to search about the cloud has gone up exponentially. Uh, uh, there is a lot of, uh, lot of money at stake, too. Uh, people really believe that, uh, that there is hundreds of billions of dollars worth of business that's out there. And, and that's, that's crucial to understand. That's crucial to understand because is it really hundreds of millions of billions of dollars worth of new business? Or is it just existing business which would, which would just be put under a cloud bucket when it's being reported henceforth? Uh, those are the nuances of it. So, so yes, uh, everyone is talking about the cloud, like Bhargava mentioned. Yes, uh, all mobile devices are hooking into the cloud, so to speak. There are a bunch of service providers who are providing cloud-based services. Uh, what does this all mean in the, in the larger context? And what exactly is the cloud? And let me start with a very simple description. And, 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 and I'll try to make this uh, much more, much more uh, you know, detail as we go forward. But then let me start with a very simple analogy. Uh, uh, what we expect from the cloud from a computing perspective, obviously, is we should be able to give it a certain request and get a certain output out of it. Right? Very much similar to what you would do with your uh, gardener, for example. You don't want to own all the tools for gardening. You don't want to own the lawnmower. You don't want to own the gas for the lawnmower. You don't want to own the clippers. You just want the gardener to come, do his job, and go away. And at the end of it, you need a mowed lawn. That's all that you're expecting, theoretically. Very simplistic, but that's exactly what you're expecting. And that's exactly what you should be expecting from the cloud, too, from an infrastructure perspective, from a software perspective, from a platform perspective. All you want to do is give it a request and expect an output out of it. Right? Um, if the gardener came back to you and he said, hey, look, you know what? You own the lawnmower. You buy the lawnmower. You buy the gas. You buy the clippers. I'll just come back every week and I'll do the lawn for you. Would that be something that you would be willing to get into? 
Probably not, because that's a capital investment. You need to buy those things. You need to maintain those things. If the lawnmower doesn't work, he's not going to work. He's going to go away. He'll ask you to fix it, and he'll go away. He'll say, no, I'll come back when it's working. Right? That is not a situation that you would want to get into. Today, most companies are in that situation. They own the hardware. They own the software. They own the applications. They own everything. Right? So, so, so to them, theoretically, it's really a walk in the clouds. It's, it's one step closer to heaven. They don't need to commission data centers. They don't need to commission hardware. They don't need to buy hardware. They don't need people doing all kinds of OS installations and upgrades. They don't really care about all that. And is that exactly what, uh, what the cloud is? I mean, that is the expectation from the cloud. And you would want to treat it as, look, all I need is I need to get this job completed in two hours. I don't care how many machines are required. I don't care how many CPUs. I don't care how much of memory, how much of RAM. I don't care. All I know is that here is the data. Here is my request. Here is what you're su supposed to do. You have two hours, and I need the results. And once the results are produced, I want 5,000 people accessing it, or a million people accessing it simultaneously. That's all I care about. So I'm perfectly all right with that middle layer being a fuzzy black box. I'm perfectly all right with that. I'm perfectly all right about not knowing what's going on in that fuzzy cloud little thing. Right? I don't care if my gardener is ill and he's going to send somebody, someone else instead to mow the lawn. I don't care. As long as my lawn is mowed and the, um, my local housing agency doesn't send me a notice saying that, look, you're not mowing your lawn, I'm perfectly all right. right? All I care about is the output. And in a very, very simplistic manner, that's exactly what the cloud is. Right? So, so if this is what the cloud is, and if I don't want to care about the nuances of the technology and the processing that's happening inside, have I achieved it? And if I have, then theoretically, it's one step closer to heaven or, or, or heaven itself. And that's the whole broad concept around the cloud. Right? And so, so let's take that, this whole thought one step further, right? So we are talking about the cloud. We just talked about it in a very simplistic manner, a fuzzy little blob, uh, which does everything, gets input requests, produces output, and I'm good to go. If I break it down into the constitution, I think I took the breaking down part too literally. So <laughs> if, if I break it down into the constituent elements, you will observe that there probably are five or six different aspects there. The first one at the bottom is the infrastructure. And the infrastructure probably has been the most difficult to deal with. I mean, there are, uh, there are, there are multiple types of, uh, of, of, of processors and platforms and architectures and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a vast subject, right? Uh, then there is the data. Uh, by data, and, 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 and actually, I want to make a demarcation between information and data. It's just a definition thing, and, 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 and probably it's, 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 it's my quirk, but it's a definition thing. To me, data is something that you own, it's something personal to you, and information is something someone else owns, but he's okay with you seeing it. So from your perspective, data is your stuff, your pictures, your files, your documents. Information is other people's files and documents that you can access and become knowledgeable about. So that's a little demarcation I'll make. And then there is probably the business functionality. And, and, and here, I use the term business functionality rather loosely. It could be any functionality. Uh, for all you know, you would want to calculate the 7 millionth digit uh, in pi, uh, right? I mean, you would want to know what the 7 millionth digit is. It's still, it's functionality. It's, it's some kind of a service, you know, a, a, a certain logic that's provided. And the layer here, which is the application development piece, is the platform to develop that functionality and provide that to the user. So, so, so these are the constituent elements into which I would divide this whole cloud paradigm into. And the reason why I would do that is, 
you will have to look at the cloud and you will have to start making sense of the cloud. You will have to start peering into the cloud. And, 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 and at a very high level, probably these, these five, six, six aspects actually let you do that very easily. And, and, and they would let you concentrate on certain areas because each of these areas has an entirely different set of challenges associated with them. Right? And the whole thing in cloud computing is, is around utility-based uh, based payments. I mean, the thing is, I would like to pay and provision what I want to use. I don't want to buy too much of it. Uh, uh, you wouldn't want to buy 100 bags of chips on, 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 on the very first day of the month, assuming that you're going to use that for the rest of the year. You wouldn't do that. You would buy a few bags of chips, and you would go back and replenish them, uh, maybe every two weeks or maybe every month. But you don't want to stock up for the entire year. Uh, and that's exactly what you shouldn't do with, uh, with infrastructure, for example. Why the hell should you have to do this elaborate exercise of trying to plan for the future and say, hey, I need 300 computers, and uh, I don't know if I'll use them today or not, but you know what? The trends indicate that by the end of the year, I will need 300 computers, so let me start provisioning it. Right? You would want to do that at, I mean, as easily and as quickly as possible. Today, it probably takes a long time for a company to provision new hardware. Uh, that's a fact of life. If it's a large company, it takes you almost three months to, uh, to provision new hardware. It takes three months because you need to get approvals, you need to get the capacity planning done, you need to get uh, space in the data center, you need to uh, get the pro procurement guys to sign a contract, and once the contract is signed, the hardware would be delivered, it has to be installed, it has to be set up, it takes a while. Right? There are too many people involved, too many moving parts, too much of politics sometimes, but that's what happens in large organizations. And that's the reason large organizations are lapping up this whole concept of the cloud. And that actually takes me to the, my next point. Is this just a fad? Is this just a fad? Because when you break down the cloud into its constituent elements, you'll observe that most of this stuff has already existed. Most of this stuff has existed in some form or the other. It has always been in existence. If you take the infrastructure piece, uh, there are application service providers who have been providing this service since the early 90s. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of companies which don't own their own data centers. Uh, Verizon, AT&T, in fact, a lot of telecom providers in the early 90s uh, gobbled up a lot of these smaller application service providers, and today they offer those services, and it's a big business for them. MCI, uh, after it merged. I mean, MCI was one of the big ones. So it existed. Uh, I, mean, it's, I mean, that's nothing new. Infra, uh, information, the internet. In fact, 10 years ago, the internet was referred to as the cloud in a lot of literature, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, I mean, they called it the cloud. The information is on the cloud. You access information from the cloud. So that form of a cloud existed too, right? Data, there have been a bunch of, I mean, Yahoo Briefcase is probably a very good example. They shut it down, I think, last month. But Yahoo Briefcase was a great example. Uh, that's where you stored your photographs, you stored your documents, you stored your files, and, and that was in the cloud. It wasn't on your desktop, it was out there, right? Business functionality, salesforce.com. It offers uh, a CRM uh, functionality. You keep uh, you know, track of uh, your, the people that you interact with, uh, you know, your sales contacts, et cetera, what you have sold them, uh, what you're buying from them, et cetera. That's existed too. So the question is, what is new here? I mean, is it just a fancy word for something that we have already been doing? I mean, is that what we have to tell ourselves? I mean, do we convince ourselves that, hey, look, I mean, we are getting bored with stuff that we have been doing for the last 20 years. Let's just coin a new phrase and feel happy about it. Is that what's going on here? Right? Because there is a lot of hype. We know that there is a lot of hype. We know everyone is talking about it. We know what the cloud means, what, what, what the constituent elements are. But most of those constituent elements have been in existence in some form or the other for almost 20, 25 years now. Right? So what is new? What is it that has changed? And and actually, if you look at what Larry Ellison said, he exactly summed that up. He said that 
you know, I don't understand what we would do differently in the light of cloud computing other than change the working in some of our ads. That's what he said. Right? And yeah, I mean, makes a lot of sense, right? And, 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 and a much more scathing statement is that you're trying to move away from the mainframes and make it open source, and that's the reason Mac came up with you know, all these open source architectures and people are, are moving towards that. Are we again going back to the monopoly? Right? I mean, I mean that is a, I mean that is a question that probably needs answering, and that is a very important question that needs answering because that would decide if it's a fad, how long it's going to stay, and 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 should we bet money on this? Right? And that's important for multiple reasons. I mean, uh, it's a it's a very simple, simple, simple argument. It's a very simple argument by virtue of the fact that when you're in the middle of a hype cycle, you never realize that you know you're in the middle of a hype cycle. Uh, you don't realize it till you actually till it actually goes down. And and probably that's true for the you know bell-bottom pants from the 70s that people used to wear. I mean, I'm sure they thought it was an everlasting uh, trend. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't last that long. Right? It lasted 20, 25 years. It was good. But it did not go very far. Uh, the dot-com era of 1999, same thing. 2005, 2006, the stock market was doing great. I mean, uh, every week it went up by a couple of hundred points. Right? Didn't last long. So, so, so the question is, is it a fad? And 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 how do you know that it is a fad? And 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 how do you decide that uh, that it's a fad and you should probably you know bet on it and how much you should bet on it? Right? And this is how the landscape looks like. There are so many vendors. Everyone is into the cloud business. And, and this looks scarily similar to 1999, the dot-com era. The picture was exactly the same. If I was making a, when I was making a presentation then, the picture looked exactly the same. Three years down the line, you know, 80% uh, of those companies didn't even exist. Right? And that is... That is what what we'll have to we'll have to consider, and I don't mean to sound skeptical. I don't mean to uh, to uh, to uh, to uh, you know to paint a bleak picture. But then the world that we are in today, I don't think you can paint a much better picture now. So, right, and that's probably a little different. So. One thing that probably did not exist all these days, despite the fact that in each of those constituent elements that we just saw, uh, some form of cloud existed, was the fact that was the fact to manage and control the crowd, the cloud as one piece. That did not exist. And that's probably the key to getting this cloud computing wagon onto the road. That is probably the most important piece in the puzzle. That is the most important piece in the puzzle by virtue of the fact that so far you could store data, so far you could store information, so far you could access information, but you couldn't do all of them together in a cohesive manner. You could provision infrastructure too, but you couldn't do everything cohesively, which means that the constituent elements existed but that binding layer that put everything together into a single solution did not exist. Right? I mean, it's like having all the ingredients at home, but you just couldn't you know, ha cook the food. I mean, if you didn't know how to cook, there's no point having all the ingredients at home. You have to go to a hotel and get your food. So, so, so that's, that's exactly what it is. And that's the reason why I believe that there is a lot of promise. There is a lot of promise by virtue of the fact that now people are actually thinking and working on how to put all these elements together. And that probably makes the biggest difference. And that is probably the reason why it's not just you know, a big piece of lead that's not going to fly. Maybe, maybe this thing will. Maybe this thing will take off. Maybe this thing will take off because in a way we seem to have gotten it. We seem to have gotten... Uh, gotten the fact that unless and until you don't ensure that all of these things work together, um, it'll, 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 it'll mean nothing. 
there will be drawbacks there will be side effects i mean yeah people are talking about security and people are talking about yeah i can't put my information on the cloud because then someone can hack into it it's visible to everyone and um, i mean i can't control information so yes people will still argue about control right and and that is very clear that is very clear by the fact that i don't know if it's very clear or not but let me just read it out to you the companies are getting onto the cloud bandwagon the lower most long bars uh, is they are using uh, it says using that's the label against it uh, implementing is the second last one and the third one is uh, is trying uh, uh, trials that's the third one and the other two at the top are you know deciding about it and not thinking about it that's the topmost one so companies are thinking about it companies are thinking about moving away from the huge data centers that they are running to the cloud and 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 it has its advantages it has its advantages by virtue of the fact that your costs are going to go down you don't have to run huge data centers you don't have to worry about being green because that's now somebody else's problem it's not your problem anymore and the somebody else has a lot of leverage of you know have i mean the, the the someone else has the economies of scale to to actually be green much better than you can with your little data center so yes a lot of people are looking about uh, looking into the cloud and that gives the critical mass that gives the critical mass that okay it's it's not just going to die one day yeah players will change but then it it's here to stay right think up uh, cloud uh, they want to pursue a hybrid path there are different uh, there are different nuances and from now on the game is just going to get complicated uh, there would be different layers people will be playing in each area there is the infrastructure as a service which basically means that you know amazon is a great example uh, actually um, I mean, on amazon you can probably get an 8 cpu machine for yourself in like 3 minutes you just need to give your credit card information and it provisions up server for you and and that's really great because if you are a small mom and pop shop you really don't have to worry about you know getting the geek squad from best buy to come install your uh, desktop for you and hook it up and there's a bunch of wires there and by mistake if you kick it it doesn't work anymore you need to call them again you don't have to worry about all that all you need to do is swipe your credit card and get hardware provision and then you can install whatever you want and 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 use it there right i mean the the possibilities are limitless uh, i mean the possibilities are always limitless it's a question of how do you bring them down to the earth and make them more implementable i think i think that's the whole whole exercise and that's the reason people are facing a lot of issues people are facing a lot of issues when they're migrating to the cloud and uh, applications uh, applications have a lot of functionality in them which cannot readily be deployed on the cloud you need to migrate them Uh, and 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 it's not an easy job because those applications have been running in your environment for 20 25 years now the same application uh, which means that there is a lot of business logic inside that application and that obviously means that all those business rules you will have to rewrite them if you are moving them to the cloud because it's not very easy to port them to the cloud so far right and if that is the task then you need to come out with ways of solving those problems so there are different types of problems you'll have to solve there are the fundamental core problems you know network security accessibility speed etc and then there are these peripheral problems that's going to make the usage of the cloud much more easier you will have to solve those problems too right and today real time transaction processing is a big deal in many industries uh, Uh, the fedex guy who delivers your package uh, most of that information has to be transmitted at real time i mean at the moment the swipe uh, is i mean the the moment the package is swiped at the local center the update has to go to the website and all this today with the current cloud infrastructure not really i mean doesn't seem to be really very possible uh, because there is a lot of integration issues uh, that we have typically seen at client places 
Uh, I mean, there are thousands of applications the client runs. Uh, some of them have to be batch oriented. Some of them have to be uh, real time. And all of a sudden, if you're going to have this cloud infrastructure, if it's a public cl cloud outside, uh, the connectivity now becomes an issue because how do you ensure that the applications which are out there uh, seamlessly integrate with the applications that are in here? So, and, and that is the reason why the concept of a hybrid cloud comes up wherein you have a private cloud and a public cloud and, you know, again, too cloudy, right? Uh, so, so, so there are a lot of these issues. I mean, there are issues which you need to sort out. There are issues which you need to solve uh, before it's going to become mainstream. It's, it's a little nascent. It's a little nascent because now you're trying to put everything together into one big bucket and shake it, right? So, so it is a little nascent. There are a bunch of challenges. The big things that would come to mind is control and security. I, I don't mean to go through the whole thing, but, 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 but there are a bunch of challenges. Security is a big challenge. Uh, security is a big challenge by virtue of the fact that today, um, any company that probably has uh, some of its data on the cloud is not going to pass a government security audit. So it's not going to pass it by virtue of the fact that uh, there are two properties of a cloud uh, that, that, that make it almost impossible for, for, for security audits to go through. Uh, the first one is the redundancy. Uh, clouds by default are redundant, so which means that your data would be replicated at multiple places so that in case some of the sites go down, you should still be able to access your data seamlessly. It's a great feature because Frankly, like I said, you don't care what happens inside the cloud. All you care about is the output. So it's a fantastic feature. So your data could be replicated at multiple places. So that's one, uh, one property. The other property is your data in the cloud is ne probably never going to die. Uh, and and, and that's, that's also a big concern. I mean, you wouldn't want, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't want some of your emails to be sticking around in the ether for a long period of time. I mean. We all have our weaknesses once in a while, and, and, and we don't want that to happen. And, and that is the reason why, uh, security-wise, you're not going to pass an audit. Uh, many companies that deal with sensitive data are not going to pass through an audit. And, and that's a big deal. So then the, the question is, why do I even go into the cloud? And then the other question is, uh, if it's not a public cloud, then it's a private cloud. And then uh, the question is, yeah, I anyways run a data center. Why do I spend extra money? and build a private cloud, uh, whereas I can just keep running the way, uh, things the way I am running them today, and things are fine. So, so why mess with it, right? So, so yeah, people, don't, people, people, people will have all those questions. Uh, all these questions will have to be answered, and uh, people are working on solutions to these questions. Right? And that probably brings me all the way here. And, and before I talk about this, I just want to kind of you know, ask, has this made any sense? Is there a big aspect that I've missed out on? Does this give you enough information? Is there, are there specific areas that you want me to elaborate on? Or is it still as cloudy as it was before I began? Which is also a fair state to be in, I mean, at the end of it. Yes? The previous seminar had a question. OK, so, so I'll answer your question in two parts. Uh, the first one is the accessibility to the cloud today seems to primarily, I mean, the only limiting factor to the accessibility to the cloud today is, seems to be the cost, right? The cost is a little high, uh, primarily because it hasn't become a volume business yet, right? Uh, it's the same example that I give about uh, hard drives. 10 years ago, uh, no one heard about a one terabyte hard drive. And today, you get it for $69, right? So, so, so that's the, that's the uh, you know, uh, so, so it is the accessibility. The second thing that I'll tell you is 
unless and until there is volume looking at public you know providers of the cloud is going to be a little difficult but you can always set them up with collaborations with large companies for universities around and and that will give you access to the cloud now the question is what do you want to accomplish by accessing the cloud right and, and, and yeah, probably, probably it's a question. Rather than it being a rhetorical question, let me ask you that question. Hmm? Absolutely, absolutely. So today, I don't think the technology is there. Today, the technology is not there for two reasons, and, and, and that's there on this slide. The first one is you cannot transfer very large amounts of data on the public broadbands that we have with the speeds that we have today. And the second thing is today, most of your cloud providers have not reached a level of maturity wherein they can give you anything more than eight CPU units at any point in time, right? And that's a big drawback today. And, and we have a I mean, we have a long way to go. Uh, we have a long way to go before we can actually tap into the cloud for theoretically unlimited amounts of processing power. Uh, today, we don't have that. And, and there is a big, uh, big, big gap in the requirement, uh, primarily because today, most people are using the cloud as a proof of concept. Uh, most companies are using it as a proof of concept. Most companies are not only using it as a proof of concept, but most companies are using it as a means of offloading their non-core activities. And non-core activities never require substantial amounts of computing power. So yes, it's still two or three years off. No, in fact, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's a very good question by virtue of the fact that we have seen that what Amazon is doing is more fundamental than what Salesforce.com is doing. We believe that Salesforce.com theoretically runs on an Amazon-like base, so to speak. But yes, if you will look at the industry maybe six years down the line or five years down the line, you will see that the proliferation of, uh, of, of Salesforce.com-like things could be a little higher um, as, opposed, uh, as compared to bare bones service offerings. Uh, and again, it's a, it's a question of how much of detail a user wants to get into. Uh, so for example, uh, if you want to use the Amazon infrastructure to create your own stuff and host it, you would go for the Amazon kind of a thing. If on the other hand you say, I don't care, all I want is a functionality, salesforce.com, SAP, you know, some kind of supply chain guys, you know, if you can give me that functionality, great, then people will gravitate towards that. And we believe that if you look at the small to medium businesses, they would probably gravitate towards uh, the salesforce.com kind of a paradigm because that way they don't have to worry about a lot of things. Whereas the larger companies which have the wherewithal and the workforce to do it might actually gravitate towards the Amazon kind of a more fundamentals uh, kind of a thing. So, so, so we, I mean, at this point in time, based on discussions, it appears that you know, larger companies are leaning towards, uh, towards the Amazon infrastructure, whereas small to medium businesses are probably more focused on, on, on this side. Yes. No. There, there, there are plans and people realize that they need those plans and because 
Otherwise, the, uh, the flexibility of using a cloud goes away. Uh, I'm, I'm, if, if I use the Google app engine and I develop a bunch of stuff that runs on the Google cloud, and tomorrow I don't like the service Google is giving me uh, or, or, or if the sales rep was rude to me and I want to move away, there is no way I can do that because I'm bound by this. And, and there are a bunch of providers who are coming up who are actually giving you the flexibility. There is uh, AppGoo, I think. It's called App, A-P-P-G-O-O. Uh, it's called AppGoo, which actually gives you that flexibility. It's actually building a wrapper around Google's uh, infrastructure or rather Google's cloud, so that when you deploy your stuff there, you're actually using the wrapper. If you want to move out, you just have to get your stuff out and put it somewhere else. So yes, it would need standards. But before that, people will probably need to develop standards about creating the cloud itself. And, 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 and I, think, uh, I, think, I think it's a long way off. So, but then uh, there, there is no governing body, so to speak, uh, for, for the specific instance that you just described no and 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 that's the other uh, stickiness things right so what's the picture of oh that was the uh, good question it's supposed to be the quantum computing the prototype which which uh, which which someone built and 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 that's probably one of the uh, one of the big things i mean if you're looking at innovation going forward in the cloud space uh, most of it is going to be in storage. Um, you know, uh, IBM has been talking about this holographic storage for the last three years. We haven't seen, I mean, it hasn't seen the light of day yet, uh, but, but, but it has a lot of good promise. Uh, and, and, and grid computing. Grid computing is probably going to become a much more important. Uh, earth computing, as they keep talking about it. And, and, and just look at the possibilities, right? Uh, uh, there is a there is a company uh, that we work with. It's an investment bank based on the West Coast. Uh, they have ten thousand uh, desktops. Um, you know, all the associates who get a desktop. Ten thousand desktops which are sitting idle for almost sixteen hours a day. Uh, eight hours when the people work, they work, and 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 I don't believe that people really utilize everything that's in there. But eight hours, whatever they work, and sixteen hours, it's definitely sitting idle. And if there was a way to make a cloud out of that and use it for processing, yeah, that would be great. Um, there are a bunch of software which help you do that, but uh, not very reliable so far. But yeah, I mean, it would it would probably do that. Right. Yes. That's exactly the earth computing thing that I was talking about. The potential there is tremendous. I mean, today, the only way this cloud computing thing can get sustained is if these large players who are providing cloud computing are going to buy a lot of CPUs and you know, stack them up and provide you the service. But like you rightly said, there, are, there is a lot of processing power. There is a lot of processing power that's sitting idle. Uh, and, and, and if there is a lot of processing power sitting idle, it makes a lot of sense to utilize that. And I don't think uh, you know, too much of effort is being spent on it, but people will eventually find out that it's probably much cheaper to uh, leverage existing CPU power than buying and commissioning new stuff. Um, and and, and, and that will probably uh, you know, lead us to you know, spending more, uh, more effort into those programs. And that's definitely... I mean, the green thing is a given. The green thing is a given by virtue of the fact that, uh, uh, that that's the way to go. Uh, otherwise, it's not sustainable anymore, right? So. It's affordable. It's, again, it's not. Uh, 2007, Citibank was spending almost, almost $200 million just trying to get green. It wasn't saving them money, but they were spending that money. And they could afford to do that then. I don't think they do anything like that now, but... You know, they could afford to do that then. And they were spending on green initiatives. And, and, and green initiatives like, you know, better cooling for the data centers and, uh, you know, better stuff. Yeah, I mean, they were doing that. So it's not affordable yet, 
maybe the policies in many countries are not conducive for, for, for go, going green today, but once that changes, it will become affordable. Yes. So, so I'll actually answer it in two parts again. The first part is what kind of bandwidth will you require for mobile devices or any other devices to leverage the cloud? And what, and, and probably the second part is going to be what kind of bandwidth do you rec would you require for large data transfers? I'll, I'll kind of you know, break it into two parts. As far as the bandwidth is concerned, I don't think you will need a hell of a lot of a bandwidth if you're only going to look at processed output. And that's the reason Edge is a little slow. Um, theoretically, it's supposed to provide you uh, almost one and a half megabits, um, I guess, but you never reach that. It kind of, uh, and, and even the 3G networks that you have today are supposed to give you almost 256 kbps or more, but you don't reach there. You, you, you hardly get anything, and it takes a while. So, so yeah, um, you need a little more than that, but you don't need something extraordinarily big. But for large data transfer, so if you have to process data, you need to get that data into the cloud somehow. And if you need to get the data into the cloud somehow, you will need a thick pipe. And, and you will need substantially large, uh, large amounts, of, uh, amounts of bandwidth. And um, I, I, I think you cannot see number three here, but the red one is the United States. It's the average broadband uh, bandwidth that a user gets South Korea is at the left, and it's 11 uh, Mbps. And the United States gets 4.7 Mbps, and, and, and it's, the, it's the second last. So you've got South Korea, Japan, Hong Kong. Just in terms of development speed? Um, average speeds. And I'm assuming, uh, yeah, it is average speeds, I think. It's both uplink and downlink. So, so it depends um, on, on, on your service provider. If you pay a lot of money, I'm sure he'll give you 12 MBPS both ways, right? So. Yes. Right. Right. Yes, and, and, and that's a big deal. In fact, I'll probably go back to one of the slides. The big deal is going to be this change management issue. It's going to be the culture issue, and, and that's always a big deal. That's always a big deal whenever something new comes. And um, it's like uh, you always need a Kennedy to kind of you know, get a man to the moon. Uh, you know, all those famous words like, we are not going to the moon because it's easy, but because it's hard, and we will do that by the end of the decade. That's the push. You'll always need that push. And you have that push today by virtue of the fact that you know, uh, the economy is down and people have to save costs. And uh, either you keep spending and be in your old ways, or uh, if you want to cut down spending, then you probably move to the cloud. And, 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 and yeah, it will, be, it, it will not be an easy thing to get people to wrap their head around the fact that uh, you know, uh, this is a new way of doing things, and it's a better way of doing things. So. Yes, you're right. In fact, we are seeing that. We are seeing that very often, that, uh, that people have read about the cloud in the magazine, or rather the boss has read about the cloud in the magazine and he wants it implemented. And the other guy say, nah, he doesn't know what he's talking about because you know this is not there, that's not there. I don't know if the CPU is there or not, and you know, all the kinds of stuff. So. Oh, there is, there is. Um, see, the security problems are, again, more in people's minds than in reality. Um, it's a strong statement, but let me explain. Uh, the reason why I say that is because, theoretically, everything that's out there is up for grabs, right? Including your mail on Gmail or your mail on Hotmail. It's up for grabs. Theoretically, anyone can access it. but Practically, how many people have really gotten access to it? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, if you really try, you can get access to it. You, if you really try, as they show in the movies, you can get access to anything. Uh, but, uh, I mean, you can, you, can, you can crack the CIA password like nobody's business, right? So, so if the CIA is not secure, then nobody is. So, so it's, I think, partly psychological too, because you will have to look at that aspect. You will have to say that what is the level of risk that I'm willing to take and how much of it is psychological risk versus how much of it is actual risk. And today, if you look at the cloud, yes, information is going to go over the net uh, to a certain place. It will be stored there. Um, if Amazon is giving you a service level agreement saying that your data will be safe, I think we should trust them, or rather we should trust them at some point, maybe not now, but maybe a month later, right? So. So from a data encryption perspective, I don't think you would want to, uh, you would want to compromise anything, right? From a technology perspective, it doesn't matter whether it's open source or closed source as long as you know that your data is safe. So from a standards perspective, yes, you're right, there are no standards today. Uh, the open source community is probably a little more active in this whole thing because theoretically, if you look at it, this whole uh, virtualization virtualization is probably the very fundamental for achieving you know a cloud infrastructure and IBM had the virtualization thing going on since you know 69 72 or something since they came out with their no 80s I think since they came out with their ZOS they I mean ZOS was basically a virtualized um, environment uh, right uh, but they they already they, they always had it but they were you know holding it close to their heart like like nobody's business. So, so that's the reason it never got into the mainstream. And that's the reason uh, it's, it's um, I mean, you had to wait till, uh, till the open source movement picked, uh, picked up a lot of uh, momentum and, and eventually VMware and all these things came along. So, so yes, uh, I mean, do you really, uh, I mean, again, it's a question of do you really care about how it's stored or are you bothered about the output? And your answer could be either ways and, and you know, the implementation could be either ways. And that's the reason why you know, people want to go to a hybrid cloud wherein they have a little cloud in there for their uh, secure stuff that they really don't want to you know, put it out there. And they want to link to a larger cloud and just utilize it. I don't know if that's answered your question. So let me quickly talk about, uh, about this, this last slide. What are the potential things over the horizon? And the first thing that I would... Uh, I would I would I would bring up is the low cost low power devices are probably going to become more and more and more prevalent. Uh, 2005, I think, uh, laptop sales uh, crossed over de uh, desktop sales. Uh, the netbook is out, uh, you know, six eight months ago, and eventually I we look at the industry and we believe that. People are going to move more towards mobility. People are going to move to more towards lesser power. They don't want to worry about 4 GB RAM laptops and uh, you know, 1 terabyte hard disks on their laptops to store all their uh, photographs and files. No, I think, I think people would only want a mechanism to plug into the cloud. And, and, and I think that would be a big trend. And I think there will be a lot of innovation which will happen along those lines. Uh, so, so that's probably probably one thing over the horizon um, that's that that's looking like it. The other thing probably is that there would probably be large data center farms rather than each company owning its own data center and worrying about power usage, um, you know, utilization, um, you know, whatnot. Probably and 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 yeah, North Dakota is probably a nice place. There is a lot of space there. You don't have to worry about cooling because it's 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 pretty cold there, so so I'm guessing that's a that's a nice place to be. And um, so so 
So that's probably the other thing on the horizon. There will be these large companies that are offering cloud services, the entire, entire gamut. And all you need to do is you just need to subscribe to that service and utilize it. So that's probably the future uh, that, uh, that it looks at. Uh, the third thing is drastic improvements in network bandwidth are probably needed. And this is more for individuals than for corporates. Corporates can always commission T1s and T3 lines and you know, get a lot of bandwidth, whereas individuals cannot. You have to rely on your uh, broadband connections, to, so to speak. So do a lot of small to medium businesses, mind you. Uh, they will have to, uh, not medium, but small businesses definitely will have to rely on that. And, and that's the reason network speed is going to be, uh, going to be the next big step, uh, right? Uh, the fourth thing is, you know, grid, earth, quantum kind of computing. Uh, that is going to be the big, a big deal because there are only so many processor cores that you can have in a CPU. Uh, 16, 32, maybe 64, but, but you're going to reach that saturation point sometime and you're going to tread very close to that quantum fuzzy thing again. Um, once things become much smaller, right? And, and that is the reason why, uh, why quantum computing is probably going to give you those parallel processing power that you don't have today. Uh, today you are limited by the CPUs that are available. Uh, and, and, and if you want to make it uh, you know, global and, 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 uh, and uh, seamless and infinite, then you will need to you know, shift the paradigm a little bit. So, 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 so that's probably one area that's going to need uh, and will warrant a lot of innovation. And the fifth thing is green. Uh, yeah, I mean, we all know that you know, things have to be green. We all know that it costs to be green. Uh, but if you look at today's uh, data centers, only 30% of, uh, of the power that the data center requires actually goes into, uh, into, into, uh, into computing. Uh, the rest of it is data center operations, cooling, maintenance, UPC, and all that kind of stuff. And if there are multiple data centers, then you're theoretically buying multiple U UPCs, and you know the capacity is usually larger than what you need. You can't control it. I mean, there are a lot of those nuances. If, on the other hand, you had one huge data center, you probably will be able to do green and other things much more efficiently than people who have individual data centers. And that is the reason. Uh, you know that opens up an um, an entirely you know different space uh, you know to uh, to uh, to look at all this and lastly and i probably have that if you uh, lastly um, i mean my point here is that smb spending small to medium business spending on hardware it hardware and infrastructure is going to go down drastically uh, that's that's probably a trend uh, you know Probably SMBs will be the ones who will need a lot of convincing because, uh, you know, especially the small businesses, uh, you know, people have certain biases and it's not easy to, uh, to, to, to get over those biases. Uh, if it's a large company, someone can always take a decision and everyone will follow. If it's your company of six to eight people, then you take the decision essentially and, uh, and, and unless and until everyone is convinced and unless and until you are convinced, you're not going to move in that direction. However, once the benefits are clear, I'm sure people will realize that. And people today spend a bunch of money. If you look at the small businesses, there is a bunch of money that's being spent just on IT. Uh, and and uh, is it being spent very efficiently? Probably not. Is there, I mean, can you get more out of the money that you're spending? Definitely. I mean, if you're able to, if you're able to have a cloud into which you can seamlessly plug in and you don't have to go ahead and, uh, and 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 putting your own stuff, I think I think I think it's a very good market, and 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 I think I think uh, you know um, people can benefit a lot. I mean, you will be able to do much better business, offer much better benefits to your clients. So, so that's probably um, the gist of it. So I'm I'm actually done with the presentation. So if there are any questions, I can I can I can take those. Hmm? Utility to telecom, the number seems really low for their IT spending, like even down to zero. Could you elaborate on why those numbers would be so low for like utilities and telecom? Which one? On the last page, there's a this utility one? and telecom. 
Oh, you mean on the last page? Yeah, in there. You said their IT spending is like zero or yeah, one. I'm kind of curious as how they got it so low. <laughs> that's, yeah, I mean, that's an aberration, I think, um, because, uh, I mean, I'm sure when Forrester collected the data, there were, there were some, uh, some aberrations. So, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's a, that's a good catch. Actually, utilities in telecom uh, seems to be low across the board. Uh, typically what happens with utilities and telecom is that it's always, it's the companies that we are talking about and not the individual, um, individual spend on utilities and telecom. That's the type of the business, right? So theoretically what that means is there aren't too many telecom companies which have six to 99 people. So, so that's how you will interpret it. Right? So uh, if you look at the top, that's the size of the company, number of people, and this is the type of industry that they are in. So, which is okay. I mean, I know that there are, there are a lot of small companies uh, you know, which do telecommunications kind of work, but it looks like none of them participated in the survey, so to speak. So. Yeah, probably an NA is, a, is a this thing. I mean, it's either NA, uh, I mean, they could have put NA, if they have put zero, I would like tend to believe that you know there isn't anyone in a six to ninety-nine this thing, which could be true. I don't know. I mean, it could be true. But 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 I think good catch. I mean, if it was utilities and telecommunications, as in spend on uh, and on on um, on uh, you know broadband connections or whatever, then yes, you're right. Uh, that's a, that's a wrong number. Thank you very much.